First thing that I do is tie in the bead and the weight in the front. So I just start my thread. Sorry? I'd love just some sparkling water. <laughs> I hate to say it. Huh? Yeah. Hey guys. Okay, all I do is the front. We're going to tie in a mono stem just to add the bead, slide the bead onto. I'm going to show you that technique. I mean, you, like I said, you can slide it straight onto the shank. But I'm going to show you this technique because it's the one I use the most as well. Okay. First thing I do is just cut a sh very short section of between 25 and 30 pound mono for this specific hook. You can get away with lighter mono if it's a smaller hook or a smaller bead. Uh, what I like to do is a trick that I've seen before is you just take your pliers. Let me see what you can say. Okay, and then just flatten the mono a bit. Just to, when I tie it in, to flatten it. But again, with a fly this size, it's not really an issue. There's a bulk underneath because you're wrapping a whole brush over it. Okay. I'm just showing you some of the little tricks we use. And when I tie in this mono, I'm tying it with its curve upwards towards the eye. So it actually that the when I put the bead on it, it actually just slides on there. Okay. Which are underneath there. Yes, underneath. The mono goes underneath the hook shank. Because the bead is obviously gonna sit underneath, you don't want it to flip the fly around. Okay. The position where you're tying it, I would say, is about I would say almost at the end of a third back on the hook shank. It's around there, that's where the bead will sit. So you still have enough space for quite a big uh, thread head and your eyes that are going to go across over the actual bead. Okay. I'm just going to use a black tungsten bead. Again, this is a formal tungsten bead. You can use any color. Um, most of the time, you barely see the bead. It really is just about adding some weight. Okay. All you do is slide it on, advance your thread a bit forward. Okay, and just put it and grab it in place. You see, I'll, I'll just what I do is I just start by tying it in just to get some tension on it, and then I just keep the bead in place. I just keep on referring back to where exactly I want it. Like I said about the end of a third back, where I want the eyes to sit. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. So you see, I start pushing it back from the front. I just push the bead down a bit there, and then I just advance over the back and just grab it from the back as well. <coughs> And you can see when I'm now tying this thread, see how I'm tying at an angle. Was that a 45 degree? Not straight onto the shank like that. I'm actually tying over the bead and under. Like that, just to create push it back into place. And I'm doing the same thing, I'm go to the front, and I do exactly the same. It just lodges that bead in place. At this point you can add some super glue or UV if you want to. I don't just because when I get going with this production style, you're tying quite a lot of flies and adding the brush and everything, you just get these fibers sticking still onto the hook. You can do obviously prepare your hooks beforehand. Um, I'm just not that uh, creative to be honest. Okay, then I just cut my mono off. Just keep a pair of side cutters handy. Okay, then the next step is now adding a weed guard at the back that'll keep your that'll keep your um, zonker strip from actually wrapping around the hook. I'm going to show you one technique that I've been using a hell of a lot these days. Um, there's two ways of doing it. So I'm going to show you the standard mono loop that you would add in. Again, with this one, what I like to do is also just take the pliers. I just flatten the point of it. That's also, it also aids in actually t grabbing the mono and just tying it in. Okay. So the first one I start right at the back and I wait, wind my way towards the eye of the hook again. When I now create my loop, again, it's personal preference. Normally, about at least half a shank length or, um, should be the length of your actual loop that keeps that zonk up. Because remember, you're also putting quite a long zonk on there, so keep that in mind. Um, but also avoid it being way too short, especially I see a lot of guys doing that. That does absolutely nothing. Okay, so you want it quite long. So I'd like to get it about half, at least half the length of the shank. And then I just grab my thread, one towards the eye again, and then run it back. As soon as I get to the point where the two legs of the loop meet, I just run my thread, I just give it a bit of an upturn like that, and I just run my thread underneath, I just push it in there, just line it up, and just grab my side cutters again, just get rid of that. Okay, so now that's the standard way of tying in just a weed guard. So what I'm going to do on top of this is the way that I've been doing it quite, quite a lot these days, um, especially with the advances in the UV glues. Did I move the camera too much? No. Okay, so... 
I'm just tying a standard black tail for this specific one. I said the color options, especially with this new um, Havoc fiber, you can the color options are endless. So you can match your Zonka to that or, or obviously give a more natural look. Okay, so what I do with my Zonka is I tie in about one and a half. Let me just turn a few that way. It's about one and a half the shank length. And with my circle hooks, I go about twice that length. I would go about that length, so I go about one and a half. I'll just clip it off. I know the professional fly tires, they would keep a little sponge with them to wet the Zonka fiber so it stays in place in that. I've used good old saliva. Um, and at the back end, I just cut the normal V into the back of the Zonka. It's just so that it rides a little bit straight and doesn't sp spin on you like a pedal would. Okay. Can everyone see that? Okay. Okay, so what I do now, when I tie in my Zonka strips, a lot of I know you can strip the fibers off of the actual strip. What I like doing is just keeping them in place. I run to about that point where I started tying my weed guard. And what I do is I almost say I create this I call it like a Dolberg diver's collar in a way. So when I grab that Zonka, you'll see quickly I create a bit of a you'll see it turns up like that. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, a bit of a lip. Then I first give it, what I make sure is that the strip actually wraps around the shank, almost sandwiches the shank, and I give it three wide turns towards the back, okay, and I come back crisscross over that, that, and again this is, for, this is done for two reasons, it holds it in place perfectly and saves a hell of a lot of time. You can obviously now strip it first and whatever, but now you get something, you still retain a lot of these fibers. And you're not wasting material at all. And you get a nice finish if you look at the back and the bottom there as well. Now, what I do differently in terms of what we got these days is this little trick here. So, what I use is I use Loons. You get various other brands as well. But I use Loons um, UV Clear. And this is their flow. This is the more runny UV resin. What I do is I simply take my, my Zonka strip. I just lift it up like that. Can you see that? Okay, so what I would do, I would just make sure my light's on. Okay. What I do is I put a dab of UV, the same length that I would have had my normal um, weed guard in. I actually use some of this flexible UV, and I actually treat the leather strip just to, just too short of where I tied it in. So you get it, still get a bit of movement there. I'd add that in. Actually just zap it. That's a few seconds, 10, 15 seconds. And you basically have a weed guard that you've created with that. You actually see it kicks it up a bit as well, like that. It's a quick, easy way to do it. It holds perfectly, especially it impregnates the, the flow, actually impregnates straight into the leather strip. So it keeps it in place. And what I do a lot of times, we add the flash underneath. You can do the same with the flash. Add a bit of a UV onto that flash strip, and it keeps it in place without wrapping. Okay, so it's quite an easy way of doing it. And it, I've, I've used it over and over again. If you use the hard and the what they call their thick version, it makes the strip too hard and you can get the strip actually breaking. But with this, um, the flex or the flow, it keeps it perfectly in shape. Okay, so there's my leather strip in. Okay, so the next, it's tying this brush. I'm going to use one of the rods, the same as yours. Okay, with these brushes, what I tend to do in the beginning is just to fold back the fibers a bit. And then just brush them back slightly. And right where I'm going to tie in the wire, I just strip a few fibers away so I can actually get some exposed wire that I tie in. Okay. And again, we're using 140 denier um, thread here, so you can really wind down on it. I, th I think 210 is a little bit excessive and creates too much bulk, especially at the eye. So you want to use one color thread throughout. So I would just tie in that brush. I'll advance my thread all the way forward to the eye. Just keep it out of the way when I actually wrap the brush. So now what I do is I pull the brush straight at a 90 degree angle towards me. And I just lift out some of these fibers. So there's two options. Rod and I discussed this as well. A lot of guys, what they do is they would brush, pre-brush the, the brushes so that the fibers are all on one side. I actually like it when it's this way around. You get a neater wrap. You get more coverage around. Um, and especially when I start taking my other brush to it, then I even out the fibers as well. But it's um, your personal preference. I said what I would personally do is just make some of these fibers slightly shorter on this brush. Okay. 
But I make sure, especially on the first one, if you have a rotary vise, make sure you really get in there, right in line with where your zonka strip starts. And then as you advance forward with your brush, just grab your fibers and just brush them back. I realize very quickly tying with um, circle hooks it makes you lazy because you don't have a hook point that can impale you. Um, I learned that the hard way this weekend. So I added some natural red color to with a one fly. Um, but as I go, I just advance this. Again, it depends on how bulky do you want this fly to be. Okay, so with these fibers, what's nice about it is you can make it very, very sparse, or you can add a hell of a lot of wraps into it to create a lot of bulk. So what I tend to do, I add quite a lot of consecutive rips to, uh, rips to this one. I just want to get it right around all the way to the front, and I try and create a little bit of bulk as I go. You see I'll even it out on the other side. But once you get going with this style of fly and you've got your brushes pre-made, you know, it, it takes, I would say, you know, let's say five, six minutes to tie a fly. If you really get going, get everything ready, your zonka strips are pre-cut, and you're just good to go. Okay, especially at the head is where I like adding a bit of bulk light close to the bead, because A, I'm going to glue onto it, and B, also I want that bit of bulk at the head that gives it that nice pushing effect when you strip it through the water. And I'll show you what I do with a UV glue on that as well. Okay, so at this point you'll see behind the bead I really get my fibers very close, and behind that bead I actually add more wraps behind there than you normally would. Okay. At that point you can still see I've got plenty of space there to not only add, by behind my hook I not only to add in another few wraps but also to form the, the actual head of the fly. Okay, so now I advance over the bead into the front. And if you are tying with dumbbell eyes and if you are um, tying the traditional mason style fly, I would really recommend that you refer back to that video that Murray did at this exact guild. He shows that perfect way of wrapping around a dumbbell eye, the beginning a brush across. That, in a small way, was a revelation in my world. Okay. Once you get to the end and now you're happy with how much fibers and how much of your brush you've used, still again, I've got plenty of space to form my head there, is I bring the wire around one more last time, and as I get to the point where I'm going to wrap around the shank again, I clean out some of the fibers there, just to expose some of the wire, and then I take my thread just to trap it. The nice thing with tying with this uh, wire, whether it's copper or whether it's the normal brush wire, that it holds in place. Even if you let go of the brush and you slip it, it doesn't. The whole thing doesn't unwind on you. Okay. And what I do here is just make sure that your thread's out of the way and that you don't have an exposed wrap right there. Just take your Please don't take your scissors, especially if you've got a good pair. Just take a normal cheap pair of side cutters and just get into that wire. The one thing that I would caution you against here is that you've just clipped this wire. It's got a very sharp point there where you've clipped it. Just make sure that you don't wrap back on it. You can give yourself quite a nasty cut. So what I do there is just use my thumbnail, or you can use a pair of pliers if you're more elegant, and just flatten that straight onto the shank. And then just grab your thread and form your thread head. You see at this stage quite a lot of bulk here, but again, we form quite pronounced heads on these flies. I like the almost hot spot look of it as well. And we use a lot of UV resin at the front here as well to create um, that shape of the head. And what I quickly do is I just get in here with my scissors, just clean out some of the fibers that are sticking out the front. Okay, just form a thread head. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go for absolute perfection if you don't mind. Uh, as I, you see, I just, for those that don't know, I'm just spinning my thread the opposite direction just to flatten out, especially when you're tying in your head. Just get a flatter layer of thread. Okay, and then you can either use a whip finish tool or I just use my fingers. But really make sure that you've got that little white tab hidden underneath the thread there. I've seen guys slice their fingers open with that so many times. Okay. I normally just put another second round of that. Okay. Okay, so 
the interest of um, demonstrating, I'll keep the fly in the vise, but what I would normally do is I would just take the fly out of the vise, put it flat down on my leg, especially if I've got a pair of jeans on, or you can put it on the tabletop, just make sure that you've got a mat down. I take my brush and I aggressively brush it and flatten on the fibers, but I'll keep it in the vise for, for this demonstration. I'm actually going to punch it out. If you don't mind, I'm actually going to do this with it. Okay, so I just brush out the fibers either side of the hook. So if you look at it from the front, I brush it down each side to get the fibers split out. Can you do it lower, Peter? So uh, sorry, screen. there. Yeah. Yeah. Can I see it there? So I would brush, obviously, towards the back, and I brush other side of the of the fly to make sure that the fibers get around other side of the hook shank and also around the point. Can you guys see that still? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, and if you look closer, you can actually see the colors that you get from these fibers. It's incredible. But when you look at it up close, you can see see how thin and how airy that is. So it really is awesome stuff, and you can create a lot more bulk. Like for my bigger star flies, and especially those deep water patterns, I would use a lot more bulk for the specific one. Okay. Let's pop that back into the vise. Is that fly? No, maybe a little bit more that way. There? Yeah. Okay. Is that fine? Okay. So the first thing I do... I'm st almost started cutting this in the traditional mason style. It's almost become the way that you cut up a largey fly in a way. Is just a long blade scissors, and I just cut it almost flush against the bottom. But remember, you've got that bead in place. It's not riding underneath. So that's kind of the level of the plane that you're working with. So if I cut it, see, parallel with that, and I just slice off these fibers. And then it becomes a case of personal preference when you start trimming the fly of how, what shape do you want and also how much fiber and bulk do you want to remove or add or keep in place. So the first thing I would do is take away from the bottom and even the front what I normally do is add a little bit of an angle straight to the front where that bead is sitting. If you look underneath there, you should be able to, you see that bead right there. Yeah. Okay. But I'm going to place the eyes almost over that, almost hides the bead in a way. But again, using a black bead like that doesn't um, to track from the fly and the same I would even leap, use a hot spot if you wanted if you want a, a bit of a accent color to it. Okay, the next part is obviously just to trim across the top. Uh, what we start with there, especially be careful of removing a lot of bulk from the front of the fly because you're going to use that to obviously create a bit of shape and also add your eyes onto. Okay, so be careful. A lot, I see a lot of guys coming in at this angle here and then you bug it and you start over again. Okay, so rather at an upward angle like that, work your way towards the back And really, you can see the translucency of this, these fibers coming through. I hope you can see it on there as well. Yeah. Okay, but really good stuff. And then, as I go, you obviously have a few of these fibers that are coming out of the brush as you cut. Let me just pull on them quite aggressively. They just pop out. And then as you work the fly, because I've tied quite a lot of these star flies and I use them quite often, I kind of know what shape I'm going for. But it really is a perfect personal preference, but what you want is something that has, if you imagine that you, that fish, looking up at this fly, especially like an ambush predator, like a larger would be, if you're looking up at this fly, you don't want the sleek, flat profile like a normal side-on profile brush fly would be that they use in the salt. You want something that you look up, you see this almost fish shape, you get the tail at the back, even if it mimics a tadpole or bait fish, you want that shape from the top, so you want that triangular shape. And we're going to create that with the eyes and also with that UV that I like putting in as well. But be careful of removing too much of the bulk, especially for a fly that's being fish static or on the drop. Okay. And then I just, as I go, I just remove some of the fibers from the bottom as well. Okay. I'm going to get into a general shape. What's nice with these fibers is even if you just cut the bottom, you already basically have your correct shape in there. You can decide how much of this you want to remove. But what I normally do is like that, I would just brush it up slightly like that, and I would just give a long, soft clip over the top like that. Okay. Okay, so the next part of this is then to add color to it. I'm not going to do it tonight if you don't mind, in the interest of time. Um, the colors that I started playing with this weekend, it takes like, the normal Sharpie permanent markers that you get, it holds them perfectly. Um, I like adding the lighter colors first. I, I started with almost a dark, darkish blue, and then a, a dark gray over the top, and then I add my black barring to it. Okay, but you can add all of it to this, but at the same time, this black and gray, just like this, is perfect. It looks like a nice little baitfish pattern, um, or even juvenile yellows that you're imitating, especially for the largies, or any of the barb species that you get. 
Okay. Okay, the next part of the process is just adding in the eyes. Um, so my fine print on this one again is I add UV over the eyes as well, so I almost seal it in. Um, if you're just gluing them on here, there's various options. You can use, um, I mean, we all know super glue doesn't last. Um, stuff like tear mender works really well, holds well in fibers like this. Um, and then there's stuff that, uh, Rod, where's Rod? Rod, what's that stuff called that you used last week? Uh, what, for the eyes. For the eyes, yeah. Yeah. That also apparently works very well. Okay. But I, so what I'm going to do in this case, I'm not going to get fancy with how I put in my eyes. All I do is just take my normal super glue, just add a dab straight on where your bead is, and I would add it in the center of where the shank sits. Okay. So I just add a dab there. Remember, I do use UV to keep it in place, so I don't have to add too much. I just use any domed eyes. These are Unreal eyes that I've got here specifically, but you can use any domed eyes and the color preference that you want. You see your packs have got red in them. Okay. Now don't like stick it down yet until I've got my second eye in place. And then you do the where you put your head around the vice and you look like an ostrich. Okay, so add another dab or super glue, just enough to keep that eye in place while I'm adding my UV. Okay. So you'll see quickly when I've added it now, it's almost, you can see the bead is just slightly, slightly exposed. See it there? Yeah. Okay, so the bead is just, just sticking out underneath. Obviously if the bead was on the shank then you won't have that. But in this case it's riding slightly underneath. And then as soon as I've got in place, and then the first thing I do is look at over the top, are the eyes aligned as much as possible. I get into this angle, see the front, and then I just check from the underneath as well and then when I stick them down you see what I do is I don't press them flat 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 against the book I actually press the front part of the eye so it actually tilts out slightly against the fibers like that because I'm creating that bit of a head to push out the fibers towards the back okay to create that V shape the dreaded get your finger full of glue mm -hmm. trick okay the nice thing with the UV when you coat it, it takes away that fingerprint, by the way. It's also a nice thing, little trick. Okay. So I'm use this one last. This is where you can, if you really want to get pedantic, you can start clipping it nice and neat and getting that exact profile that you want. But in the end, once you start tying these style patterns, it becomes personal preference. Okay, so now what I do, the first thing I do is I just take um, the normal, uh, where is this one? Is the thin? And I take the normal flow and then the thin just to do the head. So I use the normal thin UV glue for the actual thread wraps and for the head itself. You can add it to a little button if you want to. I just use the, these thin tips. And for those that don't know, especially with the loon ones, you can buy spare tips so if it gets clogged up. You can either cut off the tip or you can actually just buy these spare tips. They're very inexpensive. Um, and just buy them with your UV glue so they don't waste. And just zap it. Like a lot of these lights, um, I really like this one. Um, it's now you charge it via USB. And the, actually the color shows you if it's fully charged or not. Like the old days we used to sit there and pray a bit and go make coffee and then it's still tacky. And you start to zap it for a few seconds and as you can see it's dry. Okay. Now what I do with the, so this is the flow, I'm just going to see if you can see it there. Okay. So low guys, I think they call it the, the clear and then the run, you get all different names for it, but it's basically the more runny type that absorbs into the fibers. So the first thing that I do is I come straight over the top between the eyes. So I'm going to try and do it at this angle, it's a bit difficult. Okay, but what I do, so you can see there's my two eyes there, and what I'm trying to do when I shape this head, I'm using the back of the eyes as my reference point of shaping that actually. That's where the head would stop. Okay, so what the first thing I would do is I would add this right between the two eyes. See, I add, and I slowly, slowly add the UV is still, still soaked to the top, and then I just take my light and I just zap it. And even there, immediately you'll see I've got a really a fixed head 
how to hit in place. But it's still, I want to say, spongy to the touch. It actually keeps its shape. Okay. And yes, don't expect this exceptionally smooth silicon shaped head. It's not what you're going for. It's just adding some shape so the fly doesn't flatten out, especially when you strip it. You want to create a bit of bulk. The next step that I do then is to make sure the eyes remain in place. So remember, I've glued now between the eyes and I've not gone past the middle. What I do now is I turn it on its side like that and I start adding some of this UV flow right behind the eye. You can almost imagine that you're shaping a gill plate right behind the eye like that. Half circle like that. And then what I do is add UV straight over the eye. So that actually seals it in. So you almost encapsulate it in UV. And you use very little at a time. And this these fibers of rods, I know it sounds like I'm really just punting this, but they it really holds the glue nicely. It doesn't just seep straight into the bottom, just drop it. It really holds its shape very, very, very well. I'm super impressed. I haven't fished with it, so I can't say that it works or it doesn't, but it really for these purposes perfect. Okay, so the same here, I'm just going to repeat that. So again, go behind the eye. Almost imagine that you're creating that gill plate. Okay, right behind the eye, all the way around to align with where you glue between the two eyes. And then just add some UV straight over the top. Just seals it in. You see, I don't add UV at the bottom. You can if you want to. I think that there's no need for that. It's excessive. And it does keep that shape already. So now I'll just zap it one last time. If you are tying for an audience or for a magazine, maybe you should get in there and just get rid of some of these stray fibers. But otherwise, this fly is basically good to go.